Welcome back, everyone. This is our, actually our last session of the semester. Uh, and unfortunately, because of the, the pause that we had going remote, we're only getting up to um, the, the latter half of the 19th century. So a lot of the good stuff in the 20th century and contemporary, we won't be able to talk about this semester. Um, but I will talk about that a little bit uh, at the end, or maybe just on, on the website. I might add just an additional thing that I hope you'll, you'll, you'll watch. Um, but without further ado, our last session. So we're going we're gonna to talk about Romanticism for the first half of class. Then after the break, we're going to talk about Realism. So two really important movements uh, in, the 19th, in the 19th century. So when we're talking about Romanticism, we're in basically the first half of the 19th century. So let's say 1800 to 1848. And a good way to approach Romanticism is to play it off of what we studied last class, which is Neoclassicism. Um, and it was a little, um, um, I noticed that the views were, were much lower last, last class. Uh, we only had maybe half the views of, of, the, of the uploaded lectures, uh, which is too bad. So I hope um, as, you, as you study for the, for those of you who didn't get to, didn't have the, t the time or get the chance to, to watch those, that session, hopefully you get to do so before the final. But a good way to talk about Romanticism is to play it off of Neoclassicism because in some ways they're diametrically opposed and Romanticism is something of a reaction to Neoclassicism. So um, the art of Jacques-Louis David and uh, the French Revolution, everything we studied in the second half of last class. So this might be just a good way to brush up on it. So you remember this is David, the death of Socrates. Um, and this shows a, lot, shows us a lot of the themes that are important to neoclassicism. So this idea that reason and rationality are of prime importance, that society above all is important, and a new society, a new republic, which is what the revolution was working for. So reason, principles, rules, laws, and um, and society, a, a new a new state. This was what was most important and we could see through coming through the paintings loud and clear. And so we talked about thinkers like, actually we didn't talk so much about Hobbes, but the idea of uh, the social contract, um, the idea uh, of, um, the ideas that, that are encoded in our constitution come from Hobbes, come from Locke. And then remember Diderot, who's the one who wanted to compile the Encyclopedia of All Knowledge. These are all parts of the Enlightenment, part of this revolutionary moment of the 18th century, and they all come through loud and clear in neoclassical paintings. So above all, it was the state, the community, and the republic that was privileged by these artists. And obviously that makes sense because they're working towards a new state, a new community, and a new republic. And you'll remember in that painting we analyzed by, by uh, David, the, the death, of the, the oath of the Harati, that was that pitted family against state. That's what that political soap opera is all about. And the state wins out because, of course, you're making sacrifices for this new, this new world, this new revolutionary republic. So in neoclassicism, the state, the community, and the republic um, uh, run the table as far as importance is concerned. And there's. It's not called neoclassicism for nothing. It is, this is another look back to antiquity. And in this case, especially the Roman Republic, which is, not, um, which is not a coincidence. So many of the laws and so many of the ways in which even our own republic today is still set up and run comes directly from Roman Republic, uh, the Senate, and the way in which, um, in the way to which the politics and government was set up. So we saw that in the work. And as far as the style, it would make sense that the style is then very clear, very precise, somewhat austere. All the elements that we talked about when we talk about Jacques Louis David. So that's neoclassicism. Now, if we move on to romanticism, we're going to see that it's 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 almost flipped on its head. Um, it privileges emotions over reason, over rationality. Not in every case, but emotions become very, very important in Romanticism. Romanticism is about emotionality and very dramatic um, um, dramatic depictions of emotion. 
And whereas neoclassicism privileged the state, the city, the, the, the collective, the common good, in Romanticism, you have an escape to nature. Nature becomes really important in the period of Romanticism. And almost every example I show you in this first half of class is, are, are grand, beautiful depictions of nature. Um, and so here we have, this is Caspar David Friedrich. I'll show you another example of him right at the end, a, a German painter of the time. His very famous uh, wanderer painting. So you have this guy just off on its own, off on his own on top of this cliff. This is a nice painting for our current lockdown and social, uh, social isolation. Um, although I wish I had these views out my window. I don't. Um, so rather than privileging the collective, the group, um, romanticism will privilege in many ways the individual, um, individual emotion, individual experience of, of life. Um, and you'll see that'll come through in some of the paintings. In Romanticism, there's not so much a return to antiquity, although we will see it a little bit, but there's more of a return to the Middle Ages, and especially the Gothic. Um, we'll see this with with um, another picture, another painting of Caspar David Friedrich um, that I think I show you uh, towards the end here. And maybe one of the most important concepts for Romanticism is the sublime. So I'm not sure if you've heard this term before. Usually, like if something someone says, that, "Oh, this is sublime," uh, like this piece of cake is sublime, they just mean it's like really, really good, like overwhelmingly good and tasty. Um, but that's not the original version. That's not the original concept or definition of the sublime. There's a pretty specific definition of the sublime that comes back to this that comes back to this period of Romanticism, which comes out of these two philosophers, Burke and Kant, who we talked about last week. Um, he's one of the most important philosophers in the in modern Western philosophy. Their idea of the sublime was that it was an experience of something, usually of nature, that's so overwhelming, it's so awe-inspiring, almost terrifying, that you can't really take it all in. You just can't, your senses are saturated, you can't conceptually conceive of it. Um, it's, it's an event that just completely overwhelms your ability to understand it, or to even perceive it in its totality. So this would make sense that big works of um, these great events of these natural disasters and, and, and depictions of nature would all be in some ways part of this sublime. So where does art come into all this? Well, um, it, privilege, it allows you to have this experience of this sublime, which can be terrifying, which can completely overwhelm you. Um, think being like in a, in a horrible earthquake or think of being seeing a tsunami coming off the ocean. You know, about to wipe off, you know, um, wipe out the town that you live in, as happened with, in Lisbon, um, that great earthquake that we talked about last week. So imagine that, but then also imagine the safety of seeing it not in person, but in a painting. This was the sublime, the aesthetic of the sublime in painting. A painter could afford you this sort of terror, this, this vertigo, like in this painting, the vertigo of being off, off on this cliff up really high in this just, you know, awe, -inspi awe inspiring. Um, mountainous landscape but secretly you're safe you feel safe um, so it's almost like a thrill a scary thrill a terrifying experience <laughs> although this is maybe so much terrifying but it can be a terrifying experience but you, you you're also removed from it you're also sort of safe so if anybody likes to watch horror movies this is kind of the experience of horror movies um, which usually aren't talked about as like sublime experiences, but it kind of makes sense that the thrill, the sort of adrenaline rush you get from being scared by a film, that's coupled with the fact that uh, secretly you're just at your computer at home at night, uh, safe on, on your couch, right? So this is this is the experience of the sublime as it translates in, in works of art, and we'll see this a lot in today's class. So that's just the way to introduce uh, romanticism. Romanticism was, was more than just uh, in the visual arts. Romanticism is really important, let's say, in the history of literature. So Goethe, a German writer, one of the most important in the history of, of, of literature, he wrote what's commonly thought to be the first really modern novel, one of the first modern novels, which is The Sires of Young Werther. And it's a nice, it's a nice uh, book to read. It's quite dark. It's a story about unrequited love. So this young man um, is in love with an older woman, and this is a spoiler alert. But at the end of the book, because he can't get, to, they can't get together. Their, their love can't be requited. He commits suicide. 
and that's the end of the book. And so this is this is very much part of the, the romantic aesthetic, but here in literature, this idea of really not being reasonable, um, committing suicide seems to be one of those things, um, arguably, that's an, an irrational act, one out of passion, one out of um, um, one of some kind of, of, of troubling emotion. And so this is, it, it's front and center in this book, book by Goethe. And uh, Goethe, and, and what's, what's interesting is that at the time, there were copycat real life instances of people committing suicide. Um, the scent of rash of, of, um, of suicides throughout Europe. So it's funny, people argue about video games being dangerous and people committing acts, uh, evil acts or acts of, of violence because of what they've seen or, or the games that they've played and that sort of thing. Um, but this it couldn't be any more um, um, old school in our eyes, uh, this book, you know, one of the first modern novels that seemed to instigate um, um, copycat suicides throughout Europe. So this is very much part of the time. Of, of romanticism and an interesting debate about the relationship between art and then people's art that can be troubling, art that can be, um, in this case, thematizing suicide and unrequited love, as maybe could be dangerous. Um, or some people think um, art, um, movies, and video games and that sort of thing can can be dangerous. So that's a very debatable sociological question, but it's an interesting one to think about. Um, so we have another instance here of poetry. And poetry is important in Romanticism. Maybe I remember reading this in high school, The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. Um, and if you're, if anybody is into classic '80s metal, maybe Iron Maiden's one, one of their best songs is uh, "Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner." Though I haven't listened to it since I, who knows when I, when the last time I listened to it. So, but if you're interested, just YouTube Iron Maiden "Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner." Um, even if you just want to laugh. But more seriously, the poem itself, Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, is this classic romantic poem. Um, this is, these are the famous lines that you probably have heard or seen before, or maybe you will at some point. Day after day, day after day, we stuck nor breath nor motion, as idle as a painted ship upon a painted ocean. Water, water everywhere, and all the boards did shrink. Water, water everywhere, nor a drop to drink. So this, this might seem... You know, these are lovely words to say out loud. It's this poetry. Now, this might seem somewhat enigmatic until you know the story. So, broadly speaking, this is about a ship captain who's out at sea with 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 his with his crew, and they get lost in the fog. And there's an albatross that's circling the the ship. Um, the captain then decides to shoot the albatross and kill it, um, and he does. And then the crew gets even more lost becomes even more hopeless, and then uh, the ship becomes even more lost and hopeless, and then the crew rebels, and they force the captain to wear the dead albatross around his neck. So this is where we get the term. Um, if you have an albatross around your neck, there's like something, um, there's something weighing on you. So they deemed it to be a curse that he had killed, killed this albatross. Um, so there, there, are, there are a lot of interesting themes that come out of this. So there's the awe-inspiring dimension of, of being out at sea, of being in some ways terrorized and lost. There's the violation of nature itself, of killing this animal as a curse, very very much part of the romantic aesthetic and the lionization of, of nature. And then there's also just the madness that enters into the whole thing, with, which is encapsulated by this most famous line, water, water everywhere, and all the boards did shrink, water, water everywhere, nor a drop to drink. The idea is, and this is where you could probably go crazy, is that you're dying of thirst, you're out at sea, all your water is gone, uh, maybe you, like your food rations are gone, um, which of course did happen to people, and still happens to people, um, especially like people trying to get away from dangerous places in the world, and, and uh, migrate to um, safer shores. The crazy thing is that you're dying of thirst, but there's water everywhere around you, but you can't drink it because it's it's salt, um, and it'll dehydrate you even further. So Coleridge is sort of honing in, honing in on this on this element of just the madness of being being lost at sea. And we're gonna have a lot, an, at least two paintings that show you um, these sort of terrorizing seascapes of what it means to be at sea. It seems to be a big part of the, Roman, uh, the, 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 romantic, the romantic period. So there's definitely 
a separation between, let's say, society culture on the one hand and human activity and nature, non-human activity on the other. There's very much this separation between society, culture, and nature and the great outdoors in the period of the Romanticism. Arguably, this is completely gone today. Um, in our in our own period, it's hard for us to even conceive what it would mean to be a romantic in that sense, because there's really no place, no nook or cranny on this planet that isn't isn't in some ways um, touched by human activity. So you might know that almost every single piece of fish has um, uh, has uh, metal elements in it, or um, or plastic um, um, uh, particulates of, of, of plastic that just goes up the, the quote-unquote food chain. There's really, n other than maybe some of the deepest unexplored places in the oceans, uh, but even there I'm sure trash is piling up, th there's really no place in nature today that's untouched. So some some thinkers have, have described our, our situation uh, as a post-natural state, that we really don't have this thing called nature anymore. Um, that nature and culture are, are one, and they're completely scrambled. And we've, in some ways, we have a, we have a um, a hand in every pie, or a finger in every pie. Is that the, the, that's the expression? So if you ever Google albatross today, um, you're more likely, you're you're less likely to get something about Coleridge. You're more likely to see uh, a dead albatross whose body is desiccated and like is receding um, as it's as it's um, um, as it's corroding. And inside its belly will reveal all this plastic trash, fish nets and, and bottle tops and so on and so forth. This is all, it's, it's all over the place. So it's really unfortunate. Albatrosses, they go to lay their eggs um, near the Galapagos, and that's actually a place where a lot of trash um, um, is ending up. And then so parent albatrosses will bring these shiny objects that they think are food back to their chicks, feed the chicks, and then, you know, the whole, the whole, the whole um, ecosystem is completely jammed up uh, by, by human activity and by human um, non-biodegradable objects. So this conception of nature in the Romantic, in the romantic period is arguably um, gone, um, but maybe there are certain things that, that we can do, uh, what we eat, what we consume, what we buy, um, to help in our, our, own, our own little way. So this is part of a larger ecological discourse that on the last day of this class, I would usually give, It's I, for me, it's my the most important lecture I give. Um, it has to do with climate change and contemporary art. Um, we don't have time to do that this semester, unfortunately, but I am doing it in another upper level class. So what I'm gonna do is uh, upload it onto the website for you all. So hopefully you'll have time to, to watch it because it would be, I, I have to admit, probably the, just the most important lecture that, 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 one of the most important lectures that we can have right now. Okay, so um, there are some contemporary artists, just very quickly, that, that, that show us this post-natural condition that seems to be part of, that seems to exclude us from this romantic conception of nature, which we're going to end up talking about. This is a Chinese artist, Yao Lu, dwelling in, the, in Mount Fu, uh, Fushan, 2008. Uh, it looks like a painting, but it's not. It's photography, and it looks very beautiful at first. You think, oh, wow, these emerald landscapes and and all this beautiful fog. But when you look closer, do I have a detail for you? No, I don't. When you look closer, you notice that actually all this is trash, that this is tarp. These are tarps that cover the trash. This is what you, what's used in these landfills so that the trash doesn't blow away. And the smoke itself uh, are, are, are factories. Um, so at first you think, oh, beautiful, like old Chinese landscape. But in fact, it's a very contemporary Chinese Chinese landscape of pollution, of, um, of of industry more or less contaminating everything. Um, so there are a lot of contemporary artists that work on this question. Okay, so let's get to our examples in Romanticism. Let's go back to the early nineteenth um, century, and it's very international. So I think I have four examples for you um, from their French, um, British, and then German. So the first, and he's the earliest, is Théodore uh, Géricault. Uh, this is his Raft of the Medusa, a massive, massive painting. It's at the Louvre. I've seen it. This is one of those few paintings uh, where it's it's really, it's so massive and it, it's so impressive as a painting that it's you, you're just kind of 
you just kind of like uh, your mouth, your, your jaw just drops open when you see it in person. Um, I know that sounds cheesy, but it really is true. This is one of those, no matter how jaded or cynical you are um, uh, about, about, about art or about like aesthetic experiences, this is one of those paintings where it just, it, it, it will, it will in some ways affect you. Um, so it's from 1818, uh, 1819, again, huge, 16 feet by 23 feet. Uh, and it's depiction of a raft lost, lost at sea with all these writhing bodies, some dead, um, some pale, some like not altogether there. We might explain that in, in, in a moment. One, uh, another dead figure here just kind of draped over the edge of this of this raft. Um, and then a bit more bustling activity when you get to the top. So the, the the composition here is very different from like let's say a neoclassical composition, which is usually very clear, very stable. This composition is much more let's say diagonal, and it's constantly constantly moving, um, or it's an X. Um, and you can't really understand this work if you don't understand the the, the story. So it comes from an actual shipwreck. Um, it comes from an actual mishap at sea. The Medusa was a real ship that went out and the captain was completely incompetent. The captain was uh, a corrupt, he, was, he, he got the job uh, because he was a friend of the king. So there's, there was like this corrupt sort of, um, 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 it was a corrupt appointment. Um, and he was completely he was completely inadequate to the to the job. Um, we might this might resonate with us today as far as our politics. Um, he was completely incompetent. And so he shipwrecks the ship and then realizes there aren't enough rafts and lifeboats for everybody. So of course, as often happens, we'll talk about this in the next in the next half of this lecture, uh, class politics rear their ugly head, and all all the poor um, and the, the workers who are on the ship, they get the shaft, and then the the wealthy and of course the captain and the crew, they get the lifeboats. Initially, the captain says, "Oh, we're gonna we're gonna tow you." He made this large raft, and there were about 150 people on this raft. And he said, "With with our life life rafts, we're gonna tow you. We're gonna tow you to safety. Don't worry." But shortly thereafter, he just cuts them free. Um, he just lets them loose in, in in the ocean. And so this wouldn't be a big deal. Um, this was the raft. This is an actual drawing of what the raft was like. So different from the way Jericho uh, depicts it. So it would have been this large makeshift raft made from the wreck of the, of the ship. Um, and it wouldn't really be an issue um, for the captain. I think he was counting on these 150 people to just perish at sea, never be seen again, and then that would be it. There would be no scandal. But what happens is that 15 of them survive through... You can imagine how grisly and horrible it would be to be lost at sea for an extended period of time. Uh, there are stories of cannibalism, um, that just horrible things, um, death, and 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 people having um, um, you know basically going crazy because of lack of water and of course lack of lack of food. So it's this really intense, horrible event for the, for these hundred and fifty people, and. They almost all die. There are 15 that survive, but they do survive. They are saved. And then it becomes a big scandal in, um, um, in France. Jericho hears about it, and he paints uh, this painting and immortalizes it. Right? One of the things he does to, to, to paint this painting, this large, incredible painting, is he goes to the morgue. This is really macabre, but he goes to the morgue and he studies amputated limbs. He studies cadavers, bodies, um, and amputated limbs. So we have all these, these studies, these small paintings of actual amputated limbs. Uh, here's an arm here, a couple feet. Um, so that he could really get the look of, of, of bodily death. Um, and maybe even like a kind of cannibalistic overtones, although it's more undertones. There's no overt um, forms of cannibalism in the in the painting. Maybe it's just pointed to obliquely. But he went to the morgue um, to study to, to to figure out how to make these bodies that are you know in many ways they they seem cadaverous. Notice though, so while it's romantic in the sense that it's this crazy moment. Um, 
terrorizing. It's off in, at sea. So this is this this is the sublime. This is the overpowering forces of nature. Um, notice, however, how the bodies are still kind of beautiful. Notice how, how Jericho still has one foot in the neoclassical. A lot of these, I mean, it's just not at all how in the world if you're lost at sea for all this time, you have no food, and you're, 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 you're going crazy because you don't have water, and you're, you're dying. There's no way that your body still has this, this muscle tone. Um, there's still this sort of idealizing neoclassical kind of look to, to, to these bodies. And so he's not giving you this scene as it really was when these 15 people were saved. He's idealizing it in some ways, right? He's giving, he's giving the scene a bit of dignity. And he does it even more by, you can almost feel a ripple of energy moving from the bottom left to the top right. So you have death, despair down here. But as you move to the top right, you notice people are excited. Um, they're sort of climbing on one, one, one another. And they seem to be signaling. Right, this one's signaling with a shirt, and this guy is signaling with uh, maybe a piece of, of, of a flag. And that's not, um, they're not signaling to nothing. If you notice back here, this little dot, that's actually the ship that finds them, and they get saved. So Jericho is giving you the moment where they're, they're, they're saved, um, where they're finally going to be, they're going to come back and, and be saved. And there's another uh, really important element to this. Because this is not just about um, this scandal and this horrible event at sea. And Jericho would have been an anti-royalist. He would have been critical of the king. And so people who were critical of the monarchy at the time, they were more than happy to criticize this event, which was predicated on uh, the ship captain being this corrupt official, being appointed just because he was in, in good with, uh, with royalty. So this is a, this is a, a painting that criticizes uh, the current political regime, but it does, it's more than that. Cause, because notice, the, on the, the, the very apex of this composition, if you treat this as like the, the redemptive triangle, the redemptive triangle where, where um, they're all being saved, he gives the pride of place to the black body, to this African um, former slave, um, which we know who, who he was. Um, um, uh, Jean Charles was, was his name. He is a, a, a freed slave. This is the time, the very beginnings of, of abolition. Um, there are still debates. There are still countries that haven't abolish the slave trade. This country will take, the United States will take a lot longer to abolish strafe, slave trade um, than some of the European countries. So at this point, France has already abolished it. Um, the UK, is, the UK, I think, abolished it, but was still doing the slave trade to the United States. Um, so we're still in the thick of this, this horrible historical narrative of human traffic, trafficking from Africa and, and the slave trade. Um, and you had debates between people who thought that the slave trade was a necessary thing for various reasons. Sometimes they would say, well, it's, you, we need it for the economy. Um, and then there are other people who said, no, this is, this is immoral, no matter what. Th these would be abolitionists, people who wanted to abolish um, human slavery. And Jericho was an abolitionist. And so in, 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 in a sense, he's coded, and not so subtly, his abolitionist views in this very important painting by putting this freed slave at the top of the composition. And he's the one, maybe you're, you're, you're made to think that he's the one who actually saves everybody. Um, so there, there's a rich, multi-layered political dimension to this, this really incredible, incredible painting. And so we move from Jericho to another French painter who's equally synonymous with, uh, with Romanticism, and that's Delacroix. This is an early work of his, The Bark of Dante. Delacroix, above all, was known for using this really vivid color in his paintings, uh, a form of coloration that was, at the time, shocking, um, really, really vivid. And so we have, um, this is from Virgil, Virgil's Inferno. Um, uh, Dante, uh, Dante's Inferno, and this is Virgil, the poet Virgil, who's 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 um, uh, who's leading the way on the river Styx, um, and you have all these demons coming up onto the bark. This is again another ocean water scene in Romanticism. They love these these water scenes. You have this, you know, the, uh, the this this um, um, this sort of firing landscape of the underworld in the back. 
So really dramatic. You have these bodies that are writhing, these demons. Do I have a, no, I don't. Look at this demon, his eyes, and he's like trying to get on the boat to save himself. This one's going crazy and just biting the boat. So it's this really intense, dramatic, uh, dramatic scene um, that in this case comes from, from classic, classic poetry. Another important work of his, and this is almost as big as Jericho's uh, uh, Medusa, this is Delacroix's Death of Sardanapolis uh, from 1827. This is also, this is in the same room in the Louvre as the, as the Raptor of the Medusa. So if you ever visit Paris and you go to the Louvre, you're going to see these in person. And I can tell you they're much more impressive. And so this is also a key romantic work. Um, here you have King Sardanapolis on his bed and all sorts of mayhem happening around him. Uh, horses being killed, women being killed. Uh, the whole city seems to be on fire. In the background, you have all these jewels, all this treasure being thrown around everywhere. I mean, it's a really chaotic scene. So just at a visual level, it's quite uh, dramatic and intense. And also sort of filled with madness and death and, and terror. Uh, I mean, this, this, this woman here seems to be kind of like bound to something. Um, so you need to know the story again here. Um, this is this is from a, another classical uh, another uh, classical story. This is from an, uh, of an Assyrian king, Sardopolis, Sardanapalus, whose kingdom was uh, taken over, and he was just about to be completely taken over by an enemy force. And so what he decides to do, rather than be reasonable and just like um, let his concubines go let his soldiers go um try to try to um uh, retreat or or um or give up in a, in a in a sane way instead he just he gives the instruction to just auto destruct he has his slaves kill his concubines to kill his horses to destroy his tre treasure to light fire to his to his palace um, so rather than letting anyone else have what he has he just destroys it and then commits suicide so it's this mad political story that suits, it fits really well with, um, with romanticism. And visually, like uh, the, Bark of the Bark of Dante, uh, but even more so, this is just, a, a, just an explosion of color and very warm, high-keyed color uh, that, would have been, that would have been really intense, really quite shocking at the time and very much part of the, of the Romanesque aesthetic. Uh, we have a couple more. Now we go up to England. And a very important painter, uh, J.M.W. Turner, um, who also made these sort of sublime landscapes. He was one of the most important painters for subsequent painters, especially like Impressionism, which unfortunately we don't have, we're not going to have time to study in this class. Um, but he's really, really important. And it's sad because in his life, everybody just thought he was crazy. He died penniless. They just happen to find his paintings at some point after he died, and then he becomes this major, major artist. But initially when he's painting, people just don't understand what he's doing. Uh, it just looks like this chaotic mess. Um, and it certainly seems to be visually much more, let's say, abstract uh, and chaotic than even Delacroix. Delacroix, you have this intense color, and the composition in some ways is hard to read because it's so chaotic. But you don't have abstraction. The paint is is almost always representing something. With Turner, especially in his later work, you actually start to see the paint itself as its own sort of material component. And you know more so than the center here where you have this sun flare that seems to be um, shooting through this. This is a typhoon. This is uh, like a storm out at sea. Uh, the, the sun is sort of going through, bleeding through, intensely like leaking through this uh this the sea atmosphere and it's almost as if you're not seeing a depiction of the sun you're seeing a depiction of of what it means to actually like look at the sun as a as a subjective experience um because if you think about it uh, when you look at it, the sun you can't really see it like an objective thing independent of your eyes being completely overwhelmed by it um, you see the sun and it hurts your eyes it blinds you it creates these effects these after effects um, and like the sublime that we talked about at the beginning here, it sort of overwhelms your ability to even take it in, right? So the sun itself is this sublime thing. 
Um, they wouldn't have known this back then, but we now know that one million Earths will fit, fill inside the sun. That's how big the sun is. I don't know about you, but I can't even like put, put my mind around that, how big that is. Uh, it's an incredible uh, sublime scale. So just the sun and the way he's painted it, if you saw this in person, you would actually see the textures of the brush stroke of the paint itself. It's both representing this subjective experience of the sun, um, but the painting, the material quality of the paint itself is also this very harsh, um, sort of really highly textured um, style of painting, which was way ahead of its time. Um, but will become very, very important, let's say, in the latter part of the 19th, 19th century, which, again, unfortunately, we won't have time to study. So that's the level of style of Turner's painting style, which is very romantic. Um, then there's the story. It's another sad, horrible story out at sea. Um, so you have this typhoon, and you have this slave, sh this, this ship here. It's a slave ship. So this, again, is a story about um, um, the history of the slave trade. Um, and you notice, if you see it in person, um, but even on the screen here, you can tell, you have hands and shackles in the water. You have a leg here um, with a shackle on it, and, and <clears throat> this leg has been eaten by these sea creatures. They're supposed to be sharks, <clears throat> but they haven't. They don't really know what a shark looks like alive yet. Like you don't have the the biology. Uh, most sort of sea animals. Um, uh, weren't really well known other than their bodies that are washed up at shore. So they're not quite sure how to, Turner isn't quite sure how to depict um, um, a shark that would be eating a human out in the middle of the sea. So these look more like, I don't know, big carp or something like that, or these sort of monstrous fish things. And then you have seagulls swooping in too. So there's this really macabre scene in the front where you have all these humans, these human bodies that that are in um, that are in the water, and the ship seems to be going into the typhoon, and this might be karma. Um, the ship is like, maybe the the ship has done something bad, or at least the ship captain has. Um, well, it's a slave ship, so uh, inherently it's done something bad. Um, so it was coming back from Africa. Um, it was called the Zong, so again, an actual ship, and this was another scandal. It was called the Zong Massacre of 1781. Um, and there are a lot of studies of, of how these slave ships were. It's horrifying. It's horrible. So this is a schematic for a slave ship. These are all bodies. These are all human beings that were packed in there, um, uh, basically like sardines, in the hull of the ship. And so what would happen, often regularly, is that you'd have slaves that that were dead, um, or worse, at least for the for the captain, the one who's making money off of these human bodies, who's selling them, some would get sick. And so there are two reasons for this for this massacre, um, and unfortunately for this captain, people found out when a slave would get sick, the captain would slim, simply throw that slave overboard. And there are two reasons for this. One is that he didn't want his other slaves to be sick, um, to get sick in the same way, uh, but more importantly, if he gets back to shore uh, and he has some sick slaves who, who can't be sold, who are going to die, he can't claim them for insurance. He's, he can't in, in, uh, claim them for insurance companies. If, however, um, he has a slave that's lost at sea, then the insurance company will cover it. So you see the capitalist incentive here to just throw the human body overboard because then you can at least recoup uh, something from the insurance company rather than bringing them back sick. Um, so it's a really dark, very inherently exploitive situation. And so what, what Turner is giving you is this moment where they've been thrown overboard um, and of course they're going to drown or get attacked by um, by sharks and so on and so forth. So uh, another quite dark painting. Um, the Romanesque always has these. Uh, sorry, not the Romanesque. The Romanticism always has these very intense, intense stories. But the Romanesque isn't. Uh, my God, why am I saying the Romanesque over and over? Um, Romanticism isn't all about this really dramatic. Uh, often macabre, these macabre scenes, the Romanticism could also be very contemplative and quiet um, and, and quite, uh, quite beautiful. 
This is Caspar David Friedrich, who we saw at the beginning of class, the, the, the solitary wanderer on the, on the cliffside there. This is his monk by the sea. And Friedrich was a, a pantheist. Um, he was Christian, but he, he like Spinoza, he, he thought that God was not this, this um, father figure sitting in a cloud somewhere looking down over us. He said that the world itself, that nature, the, the, where, where we live, what we live, what we are, everything, the water, the animals, the trees, everything is, is divine. That is God. Um, so he's a pantheistic. And so in, in, in Friedrich, you often have these beautiful, quiet, contemplative, um, natural landscapes. And in this case, it's another seascape, but no drama, no violence, no death, just this beautiful, calm, contemplative um, uh, painting. And you have one solitary little monk uh, in the front here. And you almost, you identify with that monk. You almost think of, uh, you, you almost transport yourself into his body and you, you think, oh, I'm, I'm looking off at this beautiful, quiet seascape. Um, and there is something about the sea. We know this, like, Scientifically, now people have done studies about why the sea is so comforting, why it's so nice to be around the water, why it's so nice to go to the beach. Uh, there's something about the ocean that's very comforting. Um, uh, from um, that's very comforting for us. Uh, maybe it's like some distant evolutionary principle. We all, all of us, came from the ocean, way, 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 way back. Uh, so maybe there's there's some kind of some kind of comfort. Or the, pri the, the primacy of water, we're made up of 70% water. So there's something about water um, that's soothing, that's soothing for us. So it's a much more soothing contemp con con contemplative landscape that Friedrich is giving you. Um, and again, maybe a nice painting for social isolation, um, to think of just being off on your own in front of, uh, in front of this vast ocean landscape. This is very much part of the sublime aesthetic of, of Romanticism. So that's a good introduction uh, to Romanticism. And usually, and this is the part in the class, I would end this first half by playing you really the most important Romantic composer, one of the most important Romantic composers, which would be Beethoven. Um, I'm not going to do that here because it's a little long, and I feel like I've already gone long enough for this first half of the session. But um, if you ever get a chance, listen to Beethoven. I usually play you, I usually play the class, the second movement of the Moonlight Sonata. If you've never listened to the Moonlight Sonata, especially the, 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 I'm sorry, the third movement, if you if you have never listened to the very famous third movement, it's a treat, you should, you should definitely listen to it, um, but listen to his symphonies, listen to his string quartets, the other piano sonatas, they're some of the greatest works of, of art um, in all of Western, in all of Western history in, in music, so um, check him out for sure, um, and you'll definitely understand why his music is part of, of Romanticism. Okay, see you in a bit when we talk about realism. <laughs>